Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful scene. Uh, at one point this week, uh, right after I heard Malin had passed away, uh, I'd been working on Reve's service, and I just reached a point where I was like, Lord, I don't think I have any more. <laughs> I think I'm about a one sermon a week preacher, and I got three in four days, so I don't know if I can do it. I just prayed for a little while, and phew, he started filling me up again, filling me up again. It was, it was a beautiful moment. You people have been so good to me because you don't die in the same week. <laughs> I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that you don't do that. 14 years. It's, it's a real uh, blessing, but I'm going to hope and pray, and you can pray too, that as God uh, takes people home, uh, and I, I'm, I'm so, I'm so, um, how should I say, glad that uh, Reve is home. I'm glad that Malin is home, and it's beautiful, and I just hope I can be faithful even uh, when things start to stack up, God's been good, and I'm just going to try and give you the word like I always do. So would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for your word. And Lord, even though I seem to be a uh, relatively small pitcher to pour the words of life out of, I, I pray that you would continue to expand it so that I can be faithful in bringing your word. And as always, Lord, let there be oh so much more of you and so much less of me. Through Christ I come, amen. You know, I can't believe our time in Nehemiah has come to an end. I hope you've enjoyed seeing the Lego walls rise up around the pulpit area. Uh, and I marveled at the creative energy that went into them and especially our centerpiece. I love standing up here and reading Nehemiah backwards every week. It's, it's great, it's beautiful, but alas, now they must go home. So I know, that would be appropriate to say, oh. So all the Legos uh, will be out. If they could go home today, it will make me sad, but alas, Christmas is coming. Now, along with appreciation for Lego walls, I hope on a deeper level, you've also been able to identify what God has called you to build up for his glory. Not everybody in this church is gifted with Legos. Not everybody is called by God to build Lego walls, but everybody is called to build something up. I hope you've caught the vision to restore something that's been broken down in your life that God wants you to rebuild. Maybe it's a relationship that has been broken down. Maybe it's health that has crumbled or a ministry opportunity that needs to be restored. Whatever it is, I pray that you will be as successful as Nehemiah was, as we will see in our text today. Nehemiah had three successes. I'm sorry, Nehemiah's success had three elements that I believe we can learn from today and use in our lives as we seek to be faithful in our walk with Jesus and all that he calls us to do. These things are crystallized in our point. Our, your point to ponder is there in your outline, in the bulletin underneath, done deal delights and our text. Your point to ponder is this. Nehemiah saw God's work to completion, keeping his caution and yet enjoying Powerful celebration. Now, if you'd be so kind to open your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. Your Bible should just fall open automatically to Nehemiah at this point. We're in Nehemiah chapter 6. Uh, some of you may have already looked at the text and went, oh my goodness. Chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 12. Don't worry. It's not too much. We'll get through it. And we'll be doing some bunny hopping in chapter 12, so you'll be okay. I just need you to get to your Bible. Did you, did you get there to Nehemiah chapter 6? 
We have those wonderful U Bibles there at the end of your pews. They're there for you to use. I, I sure hope a lot of people took them at the funeral yesterday. So there may be a few less in the pews today. But if you don't have a Bible you can read and understand, boy, we'd love it if you would just grab that Bible and take it home. Consider it an early Christmas gift from us to you. I'm in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Verses 15 and 16 over on your outline. With God's help, we can do more and faster than we ever imagined. Have you seen this in your own life or in the lives of others? Think about that. How long did building the wall take? How long did it take? 52 days. 52 days. This is crazy crazy quick. Now, does anybody remember the specs on the wall? Does anybody remember how, how long the wall was? How long was the wall? Do you remember? Remember the, remember the length of the wall? I know it's been about three or four weeks since we talked about it. It's review time. Pop quiz. Uh, hint, hint. From here to my house. 2.5 miles. 2.5 miles. That's how long the wall was. Anybody remember how high the wall was? 27. Remember, it was, it was seven feet taller than the peak of this room. I believe the, the room was 33 feet high, right? The peak is 33 feet. Is that right? So the, so the wall was 40 feet high. And do you remember how, how thick it was at the top, how wide it was at the top? Eight feet, eight feet wide at the top. This is a massive wall. These walls have been wrecked for 100 years. And they were completely restored in two months. Now, I wonder why nobody did this before. These walls had been knocked down for 100 years. Those ruins just sat there. And people walked around them, wishing for walls. Now, all the people knew that they needed the security that the walls could offer. But they were just wishing for a hundred years. People walked around saying, I wish we had walls. I wish somebody would build some walls. I wish God would just miracle us some walls up. But wishing won't make any walls. But then there came a man who was more than just a wisher. He was a man who cried, who mourned, who prayed, who planned, who boldly proposed, traveled for months, brought the goods, rallied the troops, battled the lies and threats, and kept going until completion. I wonder what God wants us to do. So often we think so small. We think, no, that, that's been broken down. That's been messed up. Before my parents were here, before my grandparents were here, that was still messed up. Nobody can rebuild that. So often we think so small. Is there a hundred-year-old problem God is giving you Passion to solve? What wall is he calling you to rebuild? One other thing about 52 days. This, I think, is very important. Nehemiah prayed for four months before he began construction. That's the time that elapsed between chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 2, verse 1. This is amazing. Then the physical building only took two months. Nehemiah worked twice as long in prayer as he did in construction. I think that could be a word for us. There is a lesson in how to know God's work and get God's blessing. While Nehemiah's commitment to completion was obvious, 
there was more than just human determination going into this. And his enemies knew it. Look closely at the last part of verse 16. I would call it 16b. They realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Nehemiah's enemies saw the writing on the wall. Only God could have pulled this off. Nobody could do that on their own. Holy help was at work. And how in the world are we going to fight that? That's what Nehemiah's enemies were thinking at that point. Those enemies probably, when, when scary stories were told around the campfire at night, you know what they were about? They were about those people. They were about David and Goliath. They were about Joshua and the walls of Jericho coming down. They were about Moses and the Red Sea. Oh no, God is back. He's working with these people again. What are we going to do? We must be careful to build in God's strength and not our own because our enemies are always watching. I like the way David Gusick puts it. You've heard me talk about David Gusick before, the Enduring Word Commentary. The Enduring Word Commentary, if you Google it, it is one of the best commentaries I have found, let alone the fact that it's online, let alone that it's free. You should look up Enduring Word Commentary. Uh, he will enrich your Bible study, because this is the way he puts it. The enemy is only disheartened when God does the work. If it's a product of man's efforts, enemies will just laugh at you. Men might be fooled and see the work of man and be impressed sometimes. But angels in heaven and every demon in hell knows what has been done by a man and what has been done by God. Friends, what have you seen completed with God's help? Have you celebrated it? Do you talk about it? I'm going to keep going in verse 17. Verse 17 through 19. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah. And replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him, since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Arah. And his son Johanan had married the daughter of Meshulan, son of Berechiah. Verse 19, moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Oh, I hate to give you this fill-in, but you need to know that resistance can still have persistence. Resistance can still have persistence. Even when you're done, even when you've accomplished what God wanted you to do, people will still bug you. People will still attack you. It's a little scary, but I'd, I'd like you to just think for a moment about enemies that won't quit. Perhaps they are, they are physical enemies, perhaps they are spiritual enemies, but I'd like for you to just think for a moment about enemies that won't quit, because Tobiah is the poster child of them. Verse 17, Tobiah gave Nehemiah grief from the very beginning with his buddy Sanballat. You remember that for those who weren't here for the entire serv uh, series. Let's do a quick review. In Nehemiah 2, 10, verse 10, he was disturbed that Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls. In 2.19 and then 4.3, he mocked Nehemiah's work. In chapter 4, verse 7, he was mad that the work was being done. And then in chapter 6, verse 1, do you remember? He was one of the guys who said, hey, Nehemiah, stop working and come out to the plain of oh no. Remember, that's the actual name of it. Come to the plain of oh no so we can talk a little bit. He wanted to kill him. That was his plan. Tobiah, or I'll refer to him as Toby. Toby was a bad dude. He was a bad dude, but not everybody saw it. Verse 18, look hard at it. For many in Judah were under oath to him, yet the nobles of Judah were buddies with Toby because he had in-laws in the tribe of Judah. Truth is, they thought he was a great guy. Remember what I said? They reported all his good deeds to me. Don't you just love that? When people that are attacking you, people that are tearing you down, and other people come and say, oh, they're so nice. 
They're great people. Judah was the land all around Jerusalem, and Toby was just one of the guys. But the people didn't see what Nehemiah saw. They were too close to the forest to see the trees. They thought, hey, Toby's a nice guy. He's always been good to us, but Nehemiah knew the evil he was doing. He came and saw with fresh eyes and a cautious heart for God's people and God's city. God was the shepherd, and Nehemiah was the sheepdog. He was always on guard. He had as much persistence in protection as Toby had in resistance. This is quite a match. Verse 19, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. Friends, it's very likely that in the eyes of the people from Judah, Nehemiah was a bad guy. Nehemiah was not nice. Why was he bad-mouthing good old Toby? Why, we even have it in chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. He said, man, turn him on his head. Have him invaded. Have him taken away. This was Nehemiah praying for Toby. Nehemiah took the heat because he was a cautious leader. And he needed to be. He knew the rest of the story. He was on the receiving end of good old Toby's poison pen. Toby's buddies likely didn't have a clue about his nasty writing campaign that continued. Do you think maybe Toby's rotten writing was part of his good works that they were reporting on? I don't think so. But here's the cool part. Nehemiah says no more about it. He doesn't spend any time or energy trying to convince those nobles that he's good and Toby's bad. His job is not to manage the opinions of people outside the city as long as they are not hindering the work and the security that he was to complete. He was able to use the old Christian cliche to let go and let God. To let go and let God. Here's the reason we need to let go and let God. Some people never get it, friends. I've said this before, even if they do get it and they quit attacking you, there will always be someone else. Enemies are just part of life. Enemies keep us diligent and humble. Like it or not, they serve to refine us. It's scary to me how often in the Bible God uses enemies to turn his people back to him. It's amazing. Who are enemies that won't quit? And what are they teaching you? What are they teaching you? Can you let go and let God deal with them? I hope so. We have now arrived at chapter 7, verse 1. So here we go. After the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place. The gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most do. I said to them, the gatekeepers, or I should say, I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem, are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. To slightly improvise on the old Yogi Berra quote, it ain't over even when it's over. Yogi said, it, it ain't over till it's over. Well, really, Nehemiah would say, oh, it ain't over even when it's over. It still goes on. The deal was done, both physically, the wall, I have hung the doors, the gatekeepers, and spiritually, the singers and the Levites were all in place. There was completion. Ah, now Nehemiah and the rest of the people can just kick back and Gaze in the shade of the walls 
upon the security that God had given them. Nope. These walls were not built for God's people to have a nice place to live. They provided a place they could worship God more and better than ever before. This was God's city, and worship was to be at the very center of it. And this is what we'll see in chapter 12, but for now, just stay with me a little bit. Because when those, when those victories come, when those walls are completed, what does it inspire us to do? Does it inspire us to worship? Does it inspire us to be diligent in what God calls us to do? Here again, I love what David Gusick says. Every victory in our life should take us deeper into praise. If we are not praising God more and more deeply with each passing year, are we really having much victory? Maybe we are making it through tough times, but coming out more bitter and sour than ever. This is not God's victory. His victory leads to a sweeter spirit and deeper praise. End of quote. Are you getting sweeter or more bitter with time? Our completion of God's task still will require caution, but in the end, it should allow us to celebrate more freely and completely than ever before. How do we do this? How do we actually get there? How do we get free enough to celebrate? Look at verse 2. I put in charge of Jerusalem. This is a powerful point. Nehemiah gave his power to others. Wow. Remember the conspiracy theory? Oh, you just want to be king. You just want to be king. He actually gave his authority to others. God still had things for him to do, but he knew it was time to pass on the power. Sometimes we hold on to power too long. Sometimes we try to control things after things are completed, and we shouldn't. We should pass it on to somebody else. That's what Nehemiah did. Verse 2. Who did he pass the power to? A nanny. This was Nehemiah's brother, the one who first told him about the big mess in Jerusalem, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 2. His initiative and concern made him the right man to be next in line. Hananiah was the co-leader of Jerusalem. He was a man of integrity and feared God more than many. Those two things, integrity and fear of God, always go together. And they are what enable people to be great leaders and to be used greatly of God. A watch was set on the wall. I, I just got to read verse 3 one more time. One more time. I said to them, The gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. The tremendous task was complete. The walls stood solid, yet walls are worthless without watchmen. Walls are worthless without watchmen. Walls must be watched by people who are ready to defend them, or walls can become prisons for the people inside. Because the enemy will surround you. It's called a siege. Friends, these people who were guarding served as gatekeepers. They opened and closed the gates while the sun was still shining. Enemies were still prowling around. Caution went hand in hand with completion or all that was gained could be quickly lost, and there would be no celebration. In our walk with Jesus, we can often find victory. We can get free from sin. We build a wall of complete commitment to Christ. But then we post no gatekeepers. And over time, the enemy comes over the wall. What do I mean? Simply put, who are you accountable to? Who are you accountable to? Maybe you struggle with pornography or gossip or overeating or unforgiveness. What is your sticky sin? What is your sticky sin? Do you know what a sticky sin is? Did you ever walk on a, on a freshly paved road and you get blacktop on the bottom of your shoe? and it just sticks, and, it, and you, you can't get it off, you, you, and it just gets stickier and stickier. That, that's kind of what sticky sin is. And I, I believe everyone has one. Uh, actually, I believe everyone probably has about a half dozen. 
But they're sins that just stick to us. What do we do? Everyone has a sin they struggle with because we have an enemy of our soul. Once you confess it and turn from it, God helps you to build a spiritual wall against that sin, but then you still need guards to watch the walls. These are people you are accountable to, people who know your struggle, people that you've confessed your sin to, and then they will watch you. They will watch the walls around you. I was on the phone this week with a recovering heroin addict who was headed back to rehab again. He had built a wall of recovery, but then he put no one to guard it. He is accountable to no one, so the devil just comes over the wall and relapse happens. This is not God's will. This was not God's plan for Nehemiah's old Jerusalem, and it's not God's plan for your life. Who are you accountable to? Who are the guards and gatekeepers in your life? Caution is needed. On what must you keep watch? Only when completion and caution are in place can there be real celebration that will happen. Let's go over to chapter 12. I'm going to be bunny hopping a lot uh, over these names that I cannot pronounce properly and focusing on the action and celebration as it happens. I need you to get to chapter 12 real quick. I will give you the play-by-play, verse-by-verse. I'm in chapter 12, verse 27. At the dedication of the walls of Jerusalem... The Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and the music of cymbals and harps and lyres. Verse 28. The singers also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophathites, from Beth Gilgal, from the area of Giba and Asmarath, For the singers had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem, verse 30. When the priests and the Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Verse 31, I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed on top of the wall to the right towards the dung gate. Textual timeout. This is huge worship. That's happening all over the city. Man, when I think about those people who've been to the Holy Land with me, imagine a huge choir and and a band walking around the city walls. It would be awesome to behold. God's people were celebrating, and it was good. Now we hop down to verse 37. Do the hop with your eyes, verse 37. At the fountain gate, they continued directly up the steps of the city of David on the ascent to the wall and passed above the house of David to the water gate on the east. Verse 38, the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. I followed them on the top of the wall together with half the people past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, over the gate of Ephraim to the Jeshaniah gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hanel, the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate. At the gate of the guard, they stopped. Verse 40, two choirs gave thanks, then took their places in the house of God. So did I, together with the officials. Textual timeout. These people were on the move, circling the entire city, ending up at the temple. This was the culmination of the celebration. They ended at the temple. Verse 43, then we're done. And on that day they offered great sacrifice, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. Women and children also rejoiced. This is the one I want you to take home. The sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard far away. On your outline, always joyously celebrate the victories God gives. What do people hear you praising about? What do they hear you praising from far away? You know, I I, I still like it on Friday nights when you drive around Wayne County or you sit out in your backyard and you hear a a far-off football game you hear the bass drum, boom, 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 boom. Have you ever heard that in your backyard? I can hear them from Orville. I can hear it when the wind is right. You can hear the crowds cheering from far off. We're coming into the holiday season. Holiday season, don't be afraid to say holiday. Do you know the root of holiday is holy days? Okay, I know that's not very politically correct. You might want to say holy days. 
instead of holiday. But we're coming into that season where there'll be partying, singing, and general merrymaking. You might even get a little loud when you rip open that one gift that you always wanted. And then you'll forget about it in six months. But you might get a little loud about it. And that's good. So what will people hear you rejoicing about? Does anybody hear you praising God for anything? As the end of the year comes, when you look back over the year, where did you see God help you? Where did you see God grow you in a way that he never did before? Will you praise him? Will you celebrate it? I think it's funny, funny in a really sad way, that we come to Jesus' birthday and we get him nothing. And what does he really want? Here's what he wants. He wants praise. He wants the praise of his people. He wants celebration from his creation. It's a budget gift experience. All you got to do is praise him. All you got to do is give him glory for what he did. Can you do it? Would you be so bold as to say something around the Thanksgiving table or the Christmas tree? that gives glory to God over these holy days. Thanksgiving and Christmas are perfect times to reflect on the victories God has given us and worship Him loudly and proudly. How will you reflect what God has done? How will you do that as we move into these holy days ahead? Let us pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the great celebration that Nehemiah had. Lord, I pray as we come into Christmas that you would help us to celebrate the great gifts you have given us. The greatest of all is Jesus. But Lord, remind us and help us to celebrate all the other gifts too. We'll give you the glory and the praise for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen.